and uh, they are coming day to day, day by day, all the time to come and ask when are we go when we will start the program so that they can send the children. The UN Refugee Agency in Uganda is trying to help. Go to the schools, you will see people sitting on the on the at the window. You don't learn anything there, you know. So if we want to be serious about education, we have to increase substantially our efforts. So to increase those efforts, the UN has earmarked 11 million US dollars to build new schools and boost the education of the 100,000 child refugees in Uganda. But that money will only help children living in refugee settlements, and not those like Patrick who are in the city. So for now, that idea of attending class every day on schedule remains just a dream. Isabel Nakiria, CGTN, Kampala. Well, let's bring you more on this uh, refugee issue and how it impacts uh, Uganda specifically. We're joined by Monday Akol Amazima, a political analyst on regional issues. He's based uh, in Kampala. Monday, thank you so much uh, for your time. Now, of course, the AU summit has gotten underway, and this year's theme is refugees, returnees, and internally displaced people. Just how significant an issue is this in relation to Uganda's own refugee burden? Yeah, this is very significant because uh, we expect that uh, they should look seriously at the issue of ref refugee welfare and uh, safety. Definitely in Uganda we've had uh, yes, uh, a big number of refugees just because we had a success story as far as looking at uh, care caring for the refugees. But of course we've had uh, scandals of whereby some refugees are kidnapped and they disappear. So it is key that uh, refugee safety and welfare is really looked at and that's how important this summit is. Mm. And indeed, of course, we know they will look at the issue, they will talk about the issue, but what do you expect uh, to come out of this year's AU summit in terms of tangible and effective solutions to the refugee challenge across the continent? Yeah, uh, the tangible issue across the that we expect to come out or that should be tackled seriously is how how to minimize or to get away with the causes for refugees because most of the causes of refugees is bad governance in countries that leads to people running out from their countries actually the causes are both political and economical so how do they address those political uh, contradictions political challenges across the continent so that have led to uh, refugees or have led to people running for, away from their countries are like going to other countries that like refugees so they should see how they are going to solve the political and economic questions in the various mm. countries on the continent. I mean, Monday, do you think the African Union body is essentially capable of finding solutions uh, to conflict on the continent, particularly uh, since, as you mentioned, that often these issues are political? So how then, in respecting sovereignty, does the African Union go about addressing the root problems of conflict on the continent? Yeah, you, you know, where there is a will, there is a way. I think uh, the, the African Union has just paid lip service to addressing the political contradictions on the continent. But I believe if they develop a will with a commitment, they have the capacity to handle this. Let's look at uh, the case in, in Gambia, where, where Jameh had refused to hand over power. But you see, just ECOWAS forced mm -hmm. him out. So here also on the continent, if the African leaders uh, under AU can be seen not only as barking dogs but as biting dogs. I believe with the time they can address all the political contradictions on the Indeed. continent. And as you say, where there's a will, there is a way. Monday, Akol Amazima, thank you so much for that analysis. Joining us there from Kampala, Uganda. Well, the African Union's Agenda 2063 looks to significantly institute wide-ranging economic and social policies. The AU Commissioner for Economic Affairs, Professor Victor Harrison, stressed the economic policies needed to stimulate the continent. Let us promote a green economy. Social development is important. We have to strengthen education and improve the quality of education as well as protection. Lastly, we also have to develop institutions. We need to stimulate inter-African. We have to stimulate Africa's partnership with the rest of the world. And also, we have to strengthen regional integration. 
Right, let's turn to some other news now. Let's go to Nigeria, where politicians from the ruling party have been accused of using unfair schemes to hinder opposition support. The main opposition People's Democratic Party was due to hold a mega rally in Abuja. However, it was shut out of the venue despite having made payments and obtained official approval. Incumbent President Buhari is, of course, running for a second four-year term. His main contender, Atiku Abubakar, is also gunning to finally secure the presidency after four previous attempts. A record of just over 84 million voters are registered this year. Many Nigerians are dissatisfied over insecurity, rampant corruption and the oil-dependent economy's recovery from recession. In all, 73 candidates are running for president. Well, Nigeria's president, Muhammadu Buhari, took his political campaign for a second term in office to the country's commercial capital of Lagos. Tens of thousands of party supporters turned out to demonstrate their support and solidarity. Buhari and other senior party leaders have promised to build on their achievements in the past three and a half years if voted in again. Here's more from CGTN's Deji Badmos. It's the latest stop of President Muhammadu Buhari's nationwide campaign rally to build up support for his second term bid. With a population of over 20 million people, Lagos is not only a very crucial state in the coming election, it's a stronghold of the ruling All Progressives Congress. And it's perhaps no surprise that this huge crowd would turn out for the rally. The APC won the state in the 2015 presidential election. The party is hoping to repeat the feat in the coming one. Lagos is sure. Sure, very sure, 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 sure for the NPC. We have a president that says Nigeria must work for Nigerians. And this is the difference. The other one that PDP wants to feed, he said Nigeria should work for the rich. When he was Minister of Petroleum, built the three of the four refineries that we have in Nigeria today. He is the man who built 3,500 kilometers of pipelines. They haven't added much to it since then. He is the man who built the Lagos, Abekuta, Ibadan, Lagos Canal Railway. Those remarks set the stage for the president to mount the podium and address the mammoth crowd. I thank you very much and I assure you that the promise we have made 2015, based on which you elected us, we made tremendous progress, as I mentioned, by those who told you what this administration is doing on security, economy, and fighting corruption. I assure you, we will maintain focus. The APC wanted to use this rally to make a strong statement that uh, it's actually on ground in this state. And somehow it's made that statement in an emphatic way. But then the president will have to wait until the 16th of February to find out if indeed this huge crowd is actually with him. Deji Badmo, CGTN. Lagos, Nigeria. Well, time now for a short break. Here's what's still ahead on the program. Why authorities in the DRC are optimistic about containing the Ebola outbreak. And the final installment of our special series on Kenya's Lake Takana region looks at how pastoralists are protecting their communities and herds. How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you may happen for yourself? If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice.
Africa Live. Find your voice. Somalia says it wants government troops in the country strengthened so as to overcome deadly militant raids on army bases and IED attacks. CGTN's Abdulaziz Bulo reports from Mogadishu. U.S. military officials have acknowledged that an intense air offensive has degraded Al-Shabaab attacking capability. But more must be done to end militant threats in the Horn of African nation. Thomas Waldhauser, the commander of the United States Africa Command, wants Mogadishu to take more responsibility in the fight to liberate Somalia from terrorist groups. Washington is Somalia's number one ally in the war against terror and has increased its strikes on Al-Shabaab encampments from 35 in 2017 to 47 last year. 14 strikes have so far been carried out in 2019, neutralizing hundreds of militants mainly in south-central Somalia. In January, it struck fighters who had stormed an army base near Kismayo, killing 52 insurgents. Waldhauser's comments come as African Union troops plan to hand over security responsibility to Somali forces after seizing large territory of land, including Mogadishu, that were previously held by Al-Shabaab. AFRICOM feels that Somali authorities are not doing much to weaken the militants. What it wants is Somali forces to create bases in all the areas it has carried out airstrikes. It wants a standby force that can verify militant deaths after every strike. Last week, Al-Shabaab claimed responsibility for a roadside bomb that killed two senior army commanders. The sector commanders were targeted in Danane, along the Mogadishu Marka Road, from where militants have launched brazen attacks against both Somali and African Union troops. Experts say it's highly unlikely that Somali forces can go it alone without strong support. Somalia has no strong force equipped and ready to go it alone. There are sanctions and embargo in place that the U.S. can lobby for them to be lifted. Somali forces rely on AMISOM, who haven't launched any offensive in years. Therefore, it is in the interest of all aides to jointly work together and not blame each other. Mogadishu says it has 9,000 registered army personnel out of 18,000 required by the end of 2020. But once the troops strengthened, so as to overcome deadly militant raids on army bases and improvised explosive attacks. Government troops have been vital in securing major towns after the pullout of militant groups. But securing the supply route linking these towns continues to be a major obstacle for an underfunded and poorly equipped force that continues to lose soldiers and senior commanders in Al Shabaab's ever increasing guerrilla attacks. Abdul Aziz Bilon, CGT, and Mogadishu, Somalia. Let's go to the Democratic Republic of Congo now. Over the past six months, about 500 people are said to have died from the latest Ebola outbreak. However, the country's health ministry has said that thousands of deaths have been prevented as a result of a vaccination program. The epidemic is also said to have been prevented from spreading to major cities as well as neighboring countries. The outbreak began on the 1st of August last year in the North Kivu region. A surge in cases has since been reported from the 15th of January this year. The deadly outbreak has been marked as the second largest in history. Insecurity around some areas has been a great hindrance to countermeasures and treatment of those affected. The epidemic was declared on August 1, 2018. There are now 800 cases, 502 victims and 721 people have been cured. I believe that the epidemic has been well controlled in all the original hotspots, the epicenter in Mangina Beni. The epidemic has not reached major cities such as Bunia, Kisangani and Goma. I believe they have also managed to contain the spread of the epidemic, which has not reached any of the neighboring countries. We remain with an epicenter, a hotspot rather, around Katwa, which is a health zone right next to Butembo. There is a specificity here. It is that it's the area in which there has been the most hostilities, reticence and urban crime that have had a negative impact on the conduct of activities. I believe that once the situation in Katwa is under control, we will move towards the end of the epidemic. 
Former Cote d'Ivoire rebel leader Guillaume Soro has resigned as the speak as Parliament Speaker. The move has brought about some speculation that he may be thinking of running for presidency in the coming year. Soro resigned from the second most powerful job in Cote d'Ivoire's government, but has not yet confirmed or denied rumours of a presidential campaign. His supporters are, however, publicly urging him to make a run for the top post. In this instance, I tender my resignation from my function as the President of the National Assembly of the Côte d'Ivoire. Yes, I have decided to sacrifice my position for peace for Côte d'Ivoire as I've done already in the past. In Kenya's semi-arid north, hundreds of pastoralists are armed, both to defend against and engage in the age-old tradition of cattle raiding. As jobs become scarce and cattle succumb to drought, a section of pastoralists are taking up firearms to protect their communities and their herds. He keeps one eye on the cattle he is herding and another on the firearm he is holding. Herding cattle in Kenya's north is a difficult task, one filled with risks. Safu is a member of the Burana community. They keep cattle and sell them for profit. We keep goats, cows, donkeys and camels. We bring them to the watering hole every two days. Families choose family members to herd the cattle. These herders walk hundreds of kilometers and often spend months away from home in search of water and pasture. Occasionally, women from the community are sent to bring the herders food. They all have to watch out for the bandits. Marsabit shares an expansive, porous international border with Ethiopia, which has no tight grip on its southern part. The tough terrain and vast area makes this place difficult to police. Some pastoralists take the law into their own hands, sourcing illegal arms from the neighboring districts, some of which also share international borders with other countries in conflict. The easy availability of small arms in Marsabit is a motivating factor for conflict, fueling cattle raids between the communities. But Safi's firearm was provided by members of his community. <laughs> There's a committee that sits and decides who should get the firearm. So now we've been given this to protect the people and the animals. If anything happens, we are called to help. And we protect everyone, regardless of their tribe. That's why we are entrusted with the guns. The government's peace-building efforts have yielded short-term solutions in some parts. But the culture of raiding among the Samburu, Turkana, Pokot, Borana, Gabra and Rendile communities continues amidst scarce resources. In many parts there are still sporadic raids where animals are taken. It robs the communities of their livelihoods. With little guarantee of their safety, the armed herdsmen of Loyangalani trudge on, keeping their herds close and their firearms closer. Will Kisanyabwa CGTN in Loyangalani, Kenya. Recapping your top stories this hour, close to 40 heads of states are currently in Addis Ababa for the 32nd African Union Summit. This year's theme is refugees, returnees and internally displaced persons. Attendees are set to discuss how to support the millions of refugees currently living on the continent. Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi is set to take his place as the body's new chairperson. He replaces Rwandan President Paul Kagame. Nigeria's President Mohamedou Buhari took his political campaign for a second term in office to the country's commercial capital of Lagos. Tens of thousands of party supporters turned out to demonstrate their solidarity. Buhari and other senior party leaders have promised to build on their achievements over the past three and a half years if voted in again. About 500 people are said to have died from the latest Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo over the past six months. 
However, the country's health ministry has said that thousands of deaths have been prevented as a result of a vaccination program. The epidemic is also said to have been prevented from spreading to major cities and neighboring countries. The outbreak began on the 1st of August last year in the North Kivu region. A surge in cases has been reported from the 15th of January this year. And former Cote d'Ivoire rebel leader Guillaume Soro has resigned as a par uh, Speaker of Parliament. The move has brought about speculation that he may run for president later in the year. Soro resigned from the second most powerful job in Cote d'Ivoire's government, but has not yet confirmed or denied rumours of running for president. His supporters are, however, publicly urging him to run for presidency in the coming year's elections. Those are your top stories this hour. Coming up in your business news, up next. The Food and Agriculture Organization warns that a deadly virus could wipe out fish stocks in Lake Victoria. Africa is the nexus of enterprise and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects just in terms of revenues from taxes alone $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on Global Business weekdays at this time on CGTN. You don't find the stories of North Africa by sitting on the sidelines. You've got to get out, go there, and you'll find them. In the bazaars of Casablanca. Among the crowds in Cairo. Who come to visit Cairo, the ancient capital of Egypt. Along the waters of the Nile. Along the sands of the Sahara. No one else will take you where we can in North Africa. No one else will show you what it's all about. CGTN, see the difference. Africa Live. Find your voice. Now, some worrying news coming out of business. Scientists in Uganda are investigating claims that the freshwater disease known as tilapia lake virus has been detected in parts of Lake Victoria. The UN Food and Agriculture Organization warns the deadly virus could wipe out fish stocks in a short time if not contained. The virus which attacks the tilapia fish species is common in Asia. CGTN's Michael Baleke tells us more. Anxious for a big catch, but a highly contagious fish disease, the tilapia lake virus is believed to be spreading in these waters. And the UN Food and Agriculture Organization warns, while the lake virus poses no direct health risks to humans, it causes high mortalities in the Nile tilapia species. It kills tilapia on farm, farmed tilapia and uh, it registers high mortality. So the threat is that if this comes on board as a, a, another fish disease, the industry of fish farming risk collapsing. Uganda is a huge consumer of tilapia fish and a traditional dish in most countries of sub-Saharan Africa. The UN body working with local authorities has now set up a committee to investigate the reported outbreak which could have a marked impact on global food security. The virus it has not uh, yet affected our waters, uh, but it is in the region, uh, other countries have it. We are guarding against, uh, against it, and uh, we are meeting as, as uh, ministers uh, in charge of Lake Victoria, the three ministers, we are meeting soon. To, to, to look at all the, uh, the safeguards. According to the UN Agency for Food and Agriculture, the tilapia lake virus was first discovered in 2014 in Asia. 
Scientists say that Lapia Lake virus disease kills 80 to 100 percent of the fish it infects, meaning that any outbreak on these waters of Lake Victoria shared by Uganda, Kenya and Tanzania could have a serious impact on fish populations and fishing activity. Uganda's total annual fish production is about 550,000 tons, with 90% of that coming from the country's five largest freshwater lakes, according to the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. Mike Kubaleke, CGTN, Kampala, Uganda. The Petroleum Ministry has signed a deal with several banks in Egypt to provide soft loans to people who want to convert their vehicles from fuel to natural gas. The Egyptian government hopes it can reduce consumption of expensively imported fuel and create awareness to, uh, about the more affordable natural gas. CGTN's Yasser Hakim has more. The government is in the final stages of a five-year plan to completely eradicate subsidies on fuel. To make up for the hike in prices of fuel for consumers, the government has been trying to encourage car owners to revert their vehicles to natural gas. Nowadays, our production of the gas increased to 6.6 uh, 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 billion of uh, cubic feet per day. Our consumption in from the gas actually nowadays is 6 uh, uh, billion uh, cubic feet per day, so we are, sa we are actually saving a lot of uh, we have extra productions. We have a very good chance for that because we have extra production for the gas. So the gas is very cheap. Uh, there's no pollution for the gas. If you use uh, converted to 100 buses from the fuel to the gas, it will save $1 million per year. So far, most of the people who have responded to the governments are taxi drivers. Mohammed tells me it's a better option for his work. I will offer the natural gas is extremely convenient. To fill the tank, it costs one-tenth than the fuel. The service and maintenance are also cheaper. It helped increase my revenue as my expenses have dropped. I would recommend it to anyone. The Ministry of Petroleum is covering 80% of the cost of transforming the engine to natural gas. There's not much difference in the driving experience between both cars, but because it's originally fuel, it's a bit heavy and doesn't pick up speed quickly. Another setback is that in here you have the cylinder and it takes off most of this area in the trunk. But overall it's budget friendly and that's a big advantage especially with the burdens of austerity measures. According to the Ministry of Petroleum about 240,000 vehicles have been converted into natural gas. Yas Hakim for CGTN, Cairo. Let's go to South Africa now, where tenacity is said to be one of the key attributes that entrepreneurs need if they're to stand a chance of taking a business concept and creating a startup. Angela Coppola met Fezilet Lamini, who's owner of Green Scooter, for more. Lamini has been from pillar to post, looking for funding for his project. Eventually, he decided he was going to put his own money where his mouth is and start another business to fund his dream. The key driver was um, the last mile experience from a transportation perspective because I picked up that you know there's a, there's, there's a gap within the market where one could try and tackle transportation through the use of clean energy and obviously uh, utilizing business model innovation as the overall um, uh, model that I'm using, uh, you know, that's... That's pretty much why I got into it. Like I wanted to better the environment as well and also create a business that can emancipate a lot of people in the process. Green Scooter is an e-hailing platform with the vehicle as the enabler. People buy the vehicles and join the platform. What's different here is the operational cost, estimated at about 40% cheaper than their competitors. Without OPEX, it's incredibly low. For instance, for you to fully charge this vehicle from your, your, normal, your normal plug point using the municipal grid, it will cost you about 7 rand, and that's for 90 kilometers. So, you know, I would like to see this thing go national. I'd like to see it go, go into Africa as well, because remember, we're not just an e-hailing an e platform. There's e-services within it. There's also, you know, the sales of the vehicles themselves. Like any successful entrepreneur, Lamini has thought about the entire value chain and plans are well advanced to diversify into other areas. That cargo version is pretty much built for deliveries. And um, I've, been, I've shown a lot of pictures on social media in terms of how it can further be applied from a municipal perspective. Um, it can just help manage your business and save you a lot of money. Lamini is committed. He's got skin in the game, as the venture capital funds call it, and it should have attracted investors. 
they weren't that interested. Before when I, when I used to talk about it, I'd like get depressed. But now it's because you see it, you see the dream come to life from all the money you've you've and, and all the hard work you've put into it. It's actually amazing. So I have found a vestige the entire concept. Uh, it's cost me a lot of money. The first vehicle has just landed, and interest from buyers is increasing every day. Not only is this another form of transport, but it's a business opportunity and an enabler for those who are looking for something different to get into. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. Let's take a short break. Here's what's coming up next on Africa Live. So we had more about a special show held in honor of Nelson Mandela's legacy. Join us in global business and see Africa through our eyes. Africa Live. Find your voice. A special exhibition about Nelson Mandela's life and legacy has opened in London. The interactive exhibition takes a journey through Mandela's life, including his upbringing in rural Eastern Cape as the son of a chief. It also features previously unseen footage of the former president alongside more than 150 artifacts. Let's take a look. Madiba's items such as clothes, campaign posters and travel documents have been loaned to the exhibition. The family of the Nobel Peace Prize winner wants everyone to be able to commemorate his life as a freedom fighter. His grandson Mandla Mandela hopes the exhibition will inspire a sense of action and accountability in the younger generations. My grandfather during his presidential years, he wore a watch uh, uh, Pat uh, Philip Patek watch and uh, I've made that watch available because he gave me that watch and uh, I think uh, he was such a, a committed person and uh, always uh, on time and always uh, 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 held up uh, 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 time uh, and he was never late for any commitment. Even when he traveled abroad his watch remained on South African time which we found hilarious as a family. But uh, that watch is also here on display. Madiba may no longer be with us, but the fight continues. We need to champion the work that he uh, represented. He was a global icon for justice, peace, and uh, fought for human rights. And we need to take the stand to speak out. London is the first city to host the touring show before it is permanently mounted in Mandela's birthplace, Mveso. Both locals and tourists here hope to learn a thing or two from South Africa's former president's life journey. It is critical for us um, to remember this person, um, to learn from his lessons, to learn from his legacy. Um, it is now, it's our generation's responsibility to ensure that we record history for generations to come to understand the character and to understand the glorious human achievement of Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela was an iconic freedom fighter and even though he passed on a few years ago, his family hopes that his memory will remain fresh in many people's minds by holding such exhibitions. For CGTN, I am Wilkes Tanyabwa. And to Nigeria now, where youth in the country are adding their voices to the ongoing election debate in a different way. Some 10 young artists are using music to discuss good governance, inclusive dialogue and political representation. In order to promote youthful conversations around Nigeria's election, Accountability Lab Nigeria has embarked on a competition dubbed Voice to Rep. The project aims to mentor upcoming musicians to distribute socially conscious music. We've gone through a lot of trainings, they've made us see a lot of things and I see the difference. I see that it's important to actually always speak out. It's even whatever tool you have. And for me it's music and I feel like after living, leaving this place, it's, it's, it's going to be a great difference because the songs that I put out will be more conscious. A lot of people have spoken about participation, about governance, about different things. And there's no better time to talk about it than now, you know. 
it's it's been four years since our last election, and a lot of things have, may have you know been forgotten. It's easier to remember something that is you know that happens closest to you know the election period. Music has played an important role in Nigerian elections, with influential artists supporting candidates through public endorsements and campaign anthem compositions. In the past, I have supported one or two candidates that I knew personally and I felt were, were fit for office. But um, uh, right now, I think that the, the, the greater conversation is about you know, what young people need to see in terms of uh, competence in office. And uh, that's the lane I'm in right now. Despite having no prize money attached to it, the Voice 2 Rep competition is a platform for young musicians to focus on Nigeria's social development agenda. We have young people who are making socially conscious music um, for good governance, for elections, for women's participation in governance and also for the private sector and um, private sector integrity as well. Um, so we engage these people to make music and train them, mentor them, give them the platform to reach out to Nigeria, speak to Nigerians, engage Nigerians and inform Nigerians as well to ask questions and hold government accountable. Nigerian youths are hopeful that the upcoming polls will give way for leaders who will address their unemployment challenges. Beryl Oro, CGTN. Your sports news coming up next. An Egyptian volleyball star rises above cultural stereotypes to emerge as one of the best in Africa. Africa, where champions are made, records are broken, legends are born. We're there for every goal, for every knockout, step of the way. Match point only on CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice. An Egyptian volleyball player has risen above cultural stereotypes to emerge as one of the best players.